afternoon and good night to all our participants from all over the world. This is the third day of the Transport and Climate Change Week and the second morning showtime, our morning TV show that we will use to link the whole program together. Uh, we welcome you once more at bright and early at 8 a.m. from our Berlin studio, transmitting live to you to our participants from all over the world. Uh, my name is Nadja Tega and I'm a junior advisor for transport and climate change. And I'm accompanied here with my colleague Ernesto Feilbogen, who is a project manager for urban mobility and energy. We are your hosts for today and tomorrow, and we are leading you through the showtime. We will have uh, inputs from all over the world, and we try to link the different programs together. We want to be the knot for you that links the program from Asia, over Africa, over Europe, to Latin America. Good morning, Nadia. Good morning, all the friends that join us in this session, showtime session. This is a virtual effort to get together this time in the fourth edition of the Transport and Climate Change Week. Very honored and happy to be part of this team. And let me tell you, the Transport and Climate Change Week is organized by the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit on behalf of the Federal Ministry of Environment, Nature, Conservation and Nuclear Safety, the BMU, financed by the International National Climate Initiative. Now we can share with you some numbers of this Transport and Climate Change Week. You can see the slide. We are talking about five days full of knowledge. We are talking about more than 20 countries and 20 hubs transmitting different events and, 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 and talks. We are talking about 13 time zones all over the world, 60 sessions, and we are counting more than 800 participants, and we can say greenhouse gas emission 100% offset. So as you can see, we have a, a program that is packed. Uh, we will have uh, the showtime as one part of it. Um, let me show you a slide about the showtime. Uh, as you can see, we have um, country inputs from, from all over the world, country representatives of our participating countries submitted videos showing their activities in the transport sector. We also have videos from international organizations, NGOs, sometimes from academia, telling us about their ideas, innovations, perspectives on transport and climate change. Also, we will have a little bit of interaction. We will try to give you uh, an insight behind the scenes of our uh, Transport and Climate Change Week. And I also want to point you to all the features that we have on the platform, because we don't only have a program, program here that you can see in the live stream or in your national hubs. We also have other features. We have polls, we have quizzes, we have a survey. We have the wall of ideas where you can change, uh, exchange all your uh, ideas, everything you want to communicate with other participants. We also have a function of matchmaking. So if you fill out your profile, your delegate's profile, if you put uh, your tags, if you tell us what you're interested in, what you're looking for, we will connect you with other participants of this conference. So make it, even though it's hybrid, even though it's virtual, we will try to make it as connective as possible. But as I said, we also want to interact with you in the Changing Transport Showtime. So we will have the poll of the day for you. Um, where we ask you a question, and if you go right next to the live chat, you will see um, a button, as you can see here on the slide. Um, and there, we would like to ask you to answer the following question for us. Let's see if it appears. Here we go. We are interested in, uh, in, in knowing what you think is most promising for the future of mobility. Would you bet on electric mobility? Would you maybe even bet on power to X and uh, synthetic fuels? Or maybe go with the, uh, with the conventional internal combustion engine? We will look at the results of this poll at the end of the changing transport show time. And for now, we have a quiz for you, isn't that right? Yes, now that we are here, we will open this quiz segment just to share with you and see how much do we know about different topics. Let's go to the first one that is asking us how many speakers are engaged in the Transport and Climate Change Week? We can say 65, perhaps 90, 160, more than 200. Which one would be the answer? We have seen some numbers of the events. Again, 65, 90, 160, or more than 200. Let's see the correct answer, please, Nadia. 
is coming now. More than 200 speakers are engaged in the Transport and Climate Change Week. We have another quiz to share with you, and it's related with freight. Freight accounts for 40% of global GAG emissions in transport. However, how many countries have included freight-related transport activities in their second NDC? How many? What do you guess? 25%, 40%, more than 50%. Again, 25, 40, more than 50 countries have engaged, engaged related activities in their second NDC related with freight. The correct answer is now only 25. How strange. Freight accounts for 40% of global GAG emission, but only 25 countries are working on this direction. Okay, this is the quiz section. And now we are opening a very small but important segment because we want to tell you, you have seen us for the last three days, but this event has been organized for a whole year. And there are a lot of colleagues working very hard trying to organize all you are seeing now in, this, in, the, in, in the direct uh, transmissions. What about what we call regional hub coordinators? Those are the colleagues that are located in the different countries. We mentioned more than 20 countries. And you can see the picture, most of the picture of the colleagues. And perhaps they are the responsible why you knew about the event. They are responsible of creating the content for the regional programs. They made a lot of work related with the workshop, with the panel, etc. We want to share with you, those are the colleagues behind the scene and responsible for this situation. We will continue with this section. Thank you, Ernesto. Oh, can we see the slide once more? Thank you, because of course, we also want to thank the three companies that support us in putting this together. Without these three companies, nothing of this would be possible. We are totally dependent on them. And uh, so we want to thank SE Concept. That's the company that uh, enables us and you to talk to each other independently of the language you speak. They translate from English to Spanish, from French to English, and all the other ways around, and enable a true interaction that uh, we all love so much about the Transport and Climate Change Week, so a heartfelt thank you to them. And then secondly, we have Zendewerk, that is the production company that enables this transmission, that uh, well t brings all the channels together, deals with all the different inputs from, from everywhere, and sometimes also maybe with some annoying moderators, so a big thank you to you as well. And then last but not least, also to the team from Platz AG, uh, who are providing the platform. So you, everything you see, you see that on the Platz uh, platform, so without them and their uh, support, also this interaction would not be possible. Thank you very, very much to those three companies. And now I think we come to this backstage video, the interpreters that are sitting in Cologne actually, not with us here in Berlin, but in Cologne, they uh, recorded a small video for us to give us a look behind the scenes. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is a short film from Cologne. I am Jens Jaspert, one of the members of the team of interpreters providing simultaneous translation to the International Transport and Climate Change Week 2021. I'd like to show you where we work and what we do on a daily basis here. So I am entering the studios of SE Concept and I'd like to introduce to you our technical staff. On the one hand, the um, sound engineer in chief, Thomas. And on his right side, we have Nicholas. Uh, he is now checking on the signal coming from Berlin. You see the conference is going on. Simultaneous translation in French, English and Spanish is being provided from here. So we get the signal from Berlin. We add the uh, three languages uh, version. And by the way, the team of interpreters are getting some coffee and drinks. But where is the real work being done? Well, I uh, accompany, or I'd like to uh, invite you to accompany me to the backgrounds of the um, of the technical work. Here we have the booths, we have the different um, interpreters working. So if I enter one of the booths, I see my Spanish colleagues working. And now I'm entering the room of my colleague Petra, Petra de Deuter, who is now uh, 
in working, I should not disturb it too much. I hope this was an interesting insight in our daily work. Thank you for your attention and I wish you a successful week. Thank you. Bye bye. This has been a pleasure to see you. Bye bye. I was telling you, there are a lot, a lot of people behind the scenes supporting the event. And now we will go to the next segment that has to do with what happened yesterday, what happened during the last day during the event. And for that, we will welcome Daniel Bongar again on the stage. We'll make a space for him so that we can have a normal distance and then talk. And now we are not going to use the memory graphic we used yesterday, but we changed. Now we will introduce you with the world cloud, and you will see a collection of words related with the program of yesterday. Up to you, surprise, that you can find there what to talk about the yesterday program, Daniel. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you, and good morning to everybody from my side. It's uh, great to be here now on the third day, our shift day, and we see the big avoid uh, that was yesterday, I think, and we saw many different topics, uh, like uh, we have gender events, we uh, had a, a workshop in the Eastern European program uh, with people walking around on the streets while uh, meeting uh, at the same time, and uh, yeah, I think uh, we had a, the first hydrogen hour, very interesting, very different types of events. And what are you looking forward to today? So for today, I think uh, the main thing are the expert clinics. And this is really an experiment, and I'm really looking forward to it, even if maybe we can't really see what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, we have been in touch with 20 experts, and uh, so they are now zoomed in and spread ov all over the world in the different uh, hubs and uh, talk with people. And I'm really looking forward to have very interactive uh, discussions uh, in the teams, and uh, there can be many questions directly asked to the experts. Sounds really, really good. So you see, our program is uh, really, really interactive. We try to make it uh, very diverse from day to day. This day dedicated to the expert clinics. We will have later Friedel Seelayer here to tell us a little bit more about how that works. But for now, we want to continue with the program of the Changing Transport Showtime and show the first contribution that is Ernesto, you help me. Yes, I will continue. And this is the first contribution of a variety of country, very interesting. We are talking about Southeast Europe. That means a, a contribution from Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, North Macedonia and Serbia. Let's share what they have for us. We want to really make the city center as uh, friendly to pedestrians and bikers and to other people who use other mobility options rather than their private cars. In Tirana today, there are more people traveling with a bus than there are people traveling with 200,000 cars. And that is just to say that the priority should really go towards the ones that are not choosing their own private car to move uh, from their place of work to their place of life. Grad Sarajevo je u mnogome doprinio održivom i čistom transportu u Sarajevu. Izgradnjom Trebevičke žičare kao oblika održivog i zelenog transporta. Također, sa kantonom Sarajevo kao partnerom u regionalnom projektu Održiva urbana mobilnost u zemljama jugoistočne Evrope u okviru Njemačke razvojne saradnje, usvojen je plan održive urbane mobilnosti kantona Sarajevo i grada Sarajevo, koji je u suštini strateški plan osmišljen da zadovolji potrebe mobilnosti ljudi i privrednih subjekata u Sarajevu i okolini za boljom kvalitetom života. Glavni grad Podgorice u saradnji sa Njemačkom razvojnom agencijom GIZ 2019. godine započeo aktivnosti na izradi plana održave urbane mobilnosti, koji je kasnije usvojen u Skupštini glavnog grada. To je trenutak novog pristupa planiranju saobraćaja u našem gradu, koji kreira sadržaje po mjeri građana, a ne automobila. Podgorica je umeđu vremenu postala bogatija za novu mrežu biciklističkih staza, a glavni grad je pokrenuo i projekat subvencioniranja kupovine bicikala za ukupno hiljadu građana. 
Скопје се приклучува на 140 градови во светот, кој што го избрале БРТ-то за наисплатлив јавен превоз. Горди сме што Скопје е првиот град на Балканот, кој што ќе воведе БРТ систем, што не е успех само на градот, туку е успех на целата наша држава. Ова е голем историски чекор за Скопје, затоа што за прв пат во последните 40 години правиме ваква голема реформа во јавниот превоз на патници, кој што досега беше организиран преку класичен автобуски превоз. Пре свега желим да нагласим да е план одрживе урбане мобилности усвоен у децембру прошла година. Много значајни ствари се у граду Београду ради у том правцу. Наглашавам пре свега ширење пешачки зона, затим све што се активности кои се тичу реализација пројекта метро. Такоје значајно е идеја и концепт кој желимо да развиеме у Београду, а тоа е речни саобраќај. We plan, we see, we observe, and then we're able to have a more educated approach towards operators who are running our buses, or rebuilding new streets, or reconceptualizing new places, or turning whole uh, passages into pedestrian-only spaces. There are simple things that we could be doing, such as bike counters, where we are actually measuring how many bikers we have in city and how many of those are added every day. U narednim godinama u kantonu Sarajeva se desit će se velike promjene po pitanju javnog prevoza, a sve u cilju da do 2025. godine blizu 90% putnika, tj. 90% javnog prevoza u kantonu Sarajeva se odvija ekološko prihvatljivim vozima. A city gets the efficient traffic system approachable and accessible to all citizens, socially just, devoted to the sustainable mobility and protection of both environment and health of our citizens, which results in Podgorica becoming a more pleasant place to live. So to a Skopje dobiva brz, bezbeden i održiv javen transport, koji će biti dovoljno atraktiven, što će ovozmoži direktno namalovanje na sobraćanje od metež, a sa to a indirektno će ga namali i ajde za dogledovanje to od delo od nas obraćaja. Јасно е да е за развој савремено концепта урбане мобилности важно фаворизовати с една страна пешачење, а с друга страна вожнију бицикла. Така да сvi начини кои ќе учинити бицикл достапни градјанима Београда се важни и на нив радим. That was a very interesting video related with many cities, many mini cities working in different countries, encouraging sustainable urban mobility with a variety of actions. But if we want to go deeper about the idea of a network of cities, don't miss the Friday day because we have this Friday a Mobilize Your City whole day when we will go deeper about this kind of networks. And now let's talk about what is the future of the mobility. Let's see the next video and Let's have a look on this. to travel in 2030? A very, very interesting question and an inspirational video, a question that I also posed to Lucy Anderton from the International Union of Railways and Philip Turner from the International Association of Public Transport. Let's check out the second video. 
Welcome, Philip. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to participate in our Changing Transport Showtime. We are very, very glad to have you in the Transport and Climate Change Week this year. And uh, I'm really curious to hear how you see rail and public transport changing over the next 10 years to help tackle climate change in a post-COVID world. Maybe, uh, Lucy, you want to wanna give an answer to that? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I see the next 10 years really being quite transformational for, for railways. I mean, to be on track for decarbonisation before 2050, the railways really must become that backbone of a seamlessly interconnected mobility system. Um, because rail by design is energy efficient, land use efficient, um, and it's already largely electrified, actually. And in fact, rail has been the only mass transport to actually reduce its uh, emissions. So I see rail taking much larger market share in freight logistics traffic um, and especially in long distance passenger journeys with things like night trains and high speed rail really becoming um, coming into their own. Um, so, yeah, to achieve this shift, I mean, it, it really must get the right investment and the right policy support. Um, but we will also be improving our service as well as, a, as railway operators and infrastructure managers. Um, rail is already transforming, actually, um, to support what will be quite new changing behaviours post-COVID, um, new mobility needs, um, and make the most really of the emerging technologies in AI and in digital. Um, we're already seeing e-ticketing, um, mobility as a service platforms really um, expanding and uh, brand new innovative signaling systems that are really going to mean that we can carry more and more traffic on our existing systems already. So I think in the decade ahead of us, rail depots will and must become those logistics hubs and stations must be really community hubs as part of their cities and their towns and, and connect to every single other mode of transport. Okay, thanks a lot, Lucy. Uh, let me turn to Philip and ask you, like, what do you think about this question with regards to public transport? Um, I think it's such a, of the level of ambition that is required, I think over the next decade, we'll see a significant scaling up of efforts to decarbonize public transport fleets and operations. And I see that not just happening in those big cities, but in all cities and all global regions. And I think importantly for that to happen, the sector needs to be enabled. And that's not just politically and financially and why very important, it has to ha be enabled in order to fulfill its basic mission and to deliver on its zero carbon ambition. And I think this is why initiatives such as the Tumi e-bus um, mission, which UITP is part of, is, is so important because it, it can provide that support by providing those technical skills so that innovations can be rolled out on the ground. And I think as well, it can really provide an inspiration for other cities to follow, especially in the global south. So it can really accelerate that, that transition. And I feel that this is really where the value of an organisation such as UITP can add, because we can help build momentum around this shift to decarbonisation in the public transport sector, really by enabling leaders um, with the necessary know-how for stronger and more ambitious climate action. Perfect. Thank you both so much. Thanks uh, once more for, for being here with us. Um, we will, of course, uh, put your, um, your, your article and, of course, we'll link you to, your, to your website uh, on the platform. And, um, yeah, for now, thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of the Transport and Climate Change Week. Thank you. Thanks for a Thank great you. event. Thanks a lot. So as already promised in the video, in this pre-recorded video, you will find uh, the link to the first video, to the YouTube uh, video in the chat right now, right next to the live stream. Also, we are putting up an article there. We're putting the link to, to uh, a letter or an article written by the International Union of Railways and the International Association of Public Transport for the COP26. We have the COP26 uh, upcoming in November this year, and they drafted together their vision 
and their message to that event uh, for, well, for sustainable transport and uh, for the future of rail and public transport. And now we come to the next uh, country presentation. We will take a look at uh, what is happening in Indonesia. Um, we will talk Transportasi adalah sektor yang mengonsumsi energi tertinggi di 40% dari semua negara di dunia dan menyebabkan sekitar seperempat emisi karbon dioksida terkait energi. Sektor transportasi menghasilkan sekitar 136 juta ton karbon dioksida atau CO2 pada tahun 2016. Ini adalah 27 persen dari emisi gas rumah kaca terkait energi di Indonesia. Di dalam Nationally Determined Contributions atau NDC, Indonesia telah merencanakan untuk mengurangi emisi gas rumah kaca dari sektor energi setidaknya 11 persen dibandingkan dengan skenario baseline yang setara dengan 314 juta ton karbon dioksida pada tahun 2030. Dalam skenario ini, sektor transportasi ditargetkan untuk mengurangi emisi gas rumah kaca sebesar 83,1 juta ton di mana penggunaan bahan bakar alternatif direncanakan memberikan kontribusi sekitar 62,66 juta ton atau 76 persen dari mitigasi perubahan iklim dan efisiensi energi di Indonesia. satu program-program yang butuh misalnya terkait dengan bagaimana kita menghapuskan odol di Indonesia. Nah ini menjadi satu acuan bagaimana kita uh, bisa menyiapkan satu sistem pelayanan logistik yang benar-benar uh, sesuai dengan aturan yang ada. Yang kedua yang saat ini kita kembangkan adalah bagaimana Uh, angkutan publik transport khususnya untuk angkutan umum dengan skema by the service yang saat ini sudah berjalan di lima lokasi di Indonesia yang ada di Palembang, Medan, kemudian uh, Yogyakarta, Surakarta, dan Bali ini merupakan percontohan yang merupakan cikal bagaimana Indonesia bisa bangkit uh, dari keterpurukan di bidang uh, publik transport untuk itu, eh, Temanggus atau by, by the service yang merupakan ya kita beri nama dengan Temanggus ini bisa berkembang lebih baik. Nah, di samping itu juga tujuan utamanya adalah bagaimana mengurangi dampak negatif dari tingginya penggunaan kendaraan pribadi. Sehingga dampak dari kelaimat ini menjadi berkurang dengan adanya public transport yang kita kembangkan dan mudah-mudahan transportasi di negara kita di Indonesia bisa meningkat terus dan menjadi bagian yang tidak terpisahkan dari peningkatan ekonomi Indonesia. Pollution is a serious threat to people, especially in cities with high motor vehicle densities. The bad impact of air pollution underscores the need to accelerate the energy transition with an electricity-based mass public transportation system and to kiss dependency of fossil fuel. Indonesia has developed mass transportation such as LRT, MRT, commuter line, PRT, which can reduce gas emission. We also have to flop sea logistic transportation called the sea toll for smooth mobility of food to reduce logistic by trucks, considering that Indonesia consists of thousands of islands. Transport and climate change with 2021 is an excellent agenda.
we have seen impressive picture of massive road and sad, it is the, such a big issue related with air pollution. 27% of energy GAG emissions comes from transport in Indonesia, but they do have a strategy. They share with us alternative fuels, 67% reduction that they are waiting because of this strategy on alternative fuels, public transport, BRT, MRT, and also they said they need to address maritime emission. Yeah. Now I am curious because next video is related with the Mobility Institute of Berlin. We'll check that. I'm Lena from Mobility Institute Berlin, a young consultancy working on the transformation of urban mobility. And we believe that for restarting public transport after COVID-19 and for changing urban mobility, it is key for cities all around the world to create ambitious visions for the future. To find out how visions can help cities around the world pushing change forward, we started a self-funded research project and we are currently talking to more than 50 vision developers from cities all around the world. And the goal is to find out what a vision needs in order to be successful. And my colleague Nicholas now will share some first insights with you. What we learned out of the interviews we led with vision developers worldwide is that there are three core benefits when it comes to visions and how they are enabling cities to get real change happening. Um, it's alignment, focus and resilience. Alignment means that your vision um, is able to align different stakeholders behind a shared goal, behind your vision. It's that they create focus, which means that um, they are able to uh, focus attention, uh, funding and workforce that is needed. And last but not least, it creates resilience. So it makes you able to act even in disruptive situations like we have right now with COVID-19, maybe in financial crisis or in political changes. What we derived out of the interviews are a hypothesis of what a good vision has to have to make focus, alignment and resilience happen. And it's that a vision has to be ambitious, collaborative, concrete, measurable and vivid. Of course, there are like the front runner cities like Copenhagen with its 2025 carbon neutral goal or Paris with its 15 minute city. But there are dozens of other cities around the world, smaller cities that are taking the chance to drive for sustainable change in their city. For example, there's Kutsevac in Serbia or Gathinu in Greece, um, which were the first cities within their countries to develop sustainable mobility plans and therefore were pioneers. Or there is Houten, a small city next to Utrecht, uh, which developed the cyclist city for decades now. Um, and all those cities are translating their big visions and ambitious visions into concrete action plans to make this change happen. And if you're now interested in our final results or you simply want to talk about visions with us, we would be very happy to hear from you. So after the vision that we heard before on uh, how we want to travel in 2030, now Lena and Niklas from the Mobility Institute Berlin told us about their interviews and what they gathered. So they found out that what it needs for a vision to be successful is alignment of different actors, of different stakeholders, bring your people together. Then you need to focus, put resource, put attention to the vision that you want to accomplish and you create resilience. You create resilience if you have a goal, if you know where you want to go. I find that very, very interesting and impressive. And if you also think so, and if you're interested to hear more about the outcomes of the study that will be published soon, make sure to reach out to both of them. Um, and now we will follow up with a country presentation from Thailand and hear what they have to say about transport and climate change. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. We would like to thank you for inviting us to join Virtual TTT Week this year. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought unforeseen disruption to our daily life and global economy in ways that we couldn't ever imagine before. We are now living in the so-called new normal, whether it is in the term of communication of mobility, which we all must adapt to. The challenge for the transport sector during the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted from moving citizens to ensuring the cooperation of a core transportation system, which reduced work cost guarantee 
the movement of essential workers and freight. Even during the uncertain and difficult time, Thailand is keeping up its development of public transport and is aiming to reduce 31 million tons of carbon dioxide of greenhouse gas emissions to achieve its transport NDC target in 2030. In Thailand, as in many other countries around the globe, transportation and mobility play a key role to enhance not only economic but also quality of life in our city and in the rural part of the country. To ensure the sustainable climate oriented and environmental friendly development of transport sector, four pillars were set up under the 20 year Thailand Transport System Development Strategy, emphasizing transport efficiency, green and safe transport, inclusive transport, and innovation and management. Along with the goal of transforming Thailand into regional transportation hub, notable progress and activity were accomplished in recent years. One of our field of action in sustainable mobility we would like to highlight are our effort undertaken to support electrification of public transport, including policy, setting up of EV-related infrastructure, implementation of EV bus pilot project, and kick start of EV boat operation on Bangkok Canal. Another important highlight is the further development of mass transit system together with the transit-oriented development, which aim to total up 177 intermodal nodes along the rail network across the country. With the support of Iki Transfer Tap Project, we are working toward the setting up of Thailand Clean Mobility Program. The program has several objectives. One of them is to make public transport a more attractive option than traveling by car or motorcycle. To achieve this goal, the program encompasses a push and pull approach focusing on the renewable or introduction of new EV buses, reduce the use of private vehicles, and establishment of sustainable transport fund for the replication of sustainable mobility projects in other Thai cities. Thailand will never stop to improve and transform its transport and mobility system toward more sustainability accordance with our climate protection ambition and target. Finally, when we get past this crisis, we cannot go back to the world as it was before. We must not forget our responsibilities in fighting climate change and Thailand take this issue very seriously. Therefore, we are looking forward to continuing the excellent collaboration between Thailand and Germany, targeting sustainable transport and development. Hopefully, we can collaborate in the future on an even more ambitious carbon neutral development of the transport sector by emphasizing the integration of renewable energy together with our effort in the field of vehicle electrification. Thank you to you all, and we hope to meet everyone in person next year. We hope to meet everyone next year. That is uh, how this video ended, and that is, of course, our hope as well. We have a lot of fun in this hybrid format, but are looking forward to meeting you all again in person next year. In this video, we saw how uh, COVID-19 also hit the public transport sector in, in uh, Thailand very, very hard, but we also heard that we cannot go out of this crisis like the way it was before. So Thailand is doing a very good job at using this and uh, improving their transport system. We saw a lot of different approaches. We saw, for example, intermobility 
mobility into modality being uh, a big topic, 177 nodes all over Thailand, and um, even an EV program for boats on, uh, on the Thai rivers. Very, very impressive. And now we will move on to an input from the Asian Development Bank from Jamie Leather on uh, the Asian transport outlook, giving us a bit of input on how transport looks like in the rest of the region. Hello, my name is Jamie Leather and I'm the Chief of the Transport Sector Group at the Asian Development Bank. Please allow me to share some information about the Asian Transport Outlook, or ATO as we call it. As a background to the ATO, it, it is a database of transport information that will allow us to understand the current status of transport across Asia and the Pacific. It will also look at some of the historical trends and how the future will develop in relation to the movement of people and goods across the region. The key objective of ATO is to ensure we make better informed decisions based on the most recent and up-to-date information and data. It will assist ADB in our policy dialogues with our client governments and it will also allow us to measure and monitor how our transport assistance is working in terms of government's commitments to international agreements such as the Paris Agreement or the Sustainable Development Goals. The ATO combines transport data with transport policies. In terms of transport data, we cover all of the transport subsectors and we look at infrastructure, we look at transport activity and we look at the externalities such as local emissions, global emissions and road safety. On the policy side, we look at transport plans, we look at transport policies and we also look at transport components in the broader policies and commitments governments have made. The ATO data is from secondary sources, but also some primary sources, and it is open access, so all are able to use it. The ATO provides information on over 400 transport-related indicators and covers 51 economies across the Asia and the Pacific region. In May of this year, 2021, we released our second shareable database, and we hope to release an updated version in either August or September of this year. The database is available on the ADB website, adb.org, and also on our partner development for this, slowcat at slowcat.net backslash ATO. We are currently developing a policy workbook and we are in the process of incorporating over 400 policy documents into that workbook. As urban transport is a big issue across the region, we are also preparing a specific urban transport database which will look at the urban related information, the policies and some of the trends that are emerging in urban transport. The ADB sees the ATO as a multi-year program and we welcome the work and support of our donor partners and other think tanks and other institutions in this endeavour. If you are interested to work with us on the ATO, please get in contact. The ATO can be used in a number of different ways. At its simplest level, you could take an indicator, say, on infrastructure and look at how one country compares to its neighbours or those at a similar level of economic development. More complex analysis can be made when combining several indicators and seeing how they trade off against each other or the trends that are being developed within the various transport indicators, both on the infrastructure and the usage of that infrastructure as well as the emissions associated with that infrastructure. And on that, it allows us to measure the progress against regional or global uh, systems such as the SDGs or the Paris Agreement. One example will be the use of ATO to monitor the performance against the Declaration on Sustainable Transport in Asia. And we're working very closely with our development partner, the UNCRD, in the use of ATO in monitoring and measuring against that new declaration out to 2030. The ATO can be used by governments to assess their national transport policies or their transport development goals and objectives. Within ADB, we will use the ATO at the project level at the programmatic level, but also in our policy dialogue with governments to assist them realise their objectives in terms of the development of a more sustainable transport future and mobility for all. 
I hope you'll be able to join us this 24th of June at the Transport and Climate Change in Asia session, where we'll be hearing much more about the ATO. The session runs from 7.30 to 8 a.m. on 24th June. Hope to see you there. Asia Transport Outlook, ATO, database on transport that helps us to understand the current situation, to learn about history, and also to take better informed decision. Great, it is open access as well. They mentioned they are going to be in a session tomorrow, 24th of June, in this Transport and Climate Change Week, thanks to the Asia Development Bank. We will move forward, and now it is time for the Transport Initiative for Asia. In 2015, the world community met in Paris and a vow to limit global warming to well below two degrees Celsius. Radically reducing emissions in the transport sector will be crucial for achieving this goal, as transport is responsible for nearly one quarter of energy emissions. Furthermore, within the transport sector, Asia is of key importance. The region is already responsible for over 25% of transport emissions and is expected to experience rapid growth in car ownership and freight transport in coming years. In the race to decarbonize by 2050, technological innovation will certainly play an important role. However, it will not be enough by itself. We also need to engage in long-term planning. Indeed, success will hinge on the adoption of enlightened policies and regulations that are ambitious, yet also tailored to realities on the ground. The NDC Transport Initiative for Asia aims to facilitate a sea change in the Asian transport sector. The program's participating organizations have been working with partners in China, India and Vietnam to develop comprehensive and viable decarbonization strategies. In this work, an emphasis is placed on consensus building between stakeholders, including government ministries, companies, academia and civil society. With the goal of encouraging discussion on the decarbonisation of transport in additional countries in the region, the Council for Decarbonising Transport in Asia was recently established under the umbrella of the NDC Transport Initiative for Asia. The Council is composed of recognised experts, practitioners and thought leaders from academia, civil society, business and financial institutions. The overarching mission of the Council is to develop a vision for achieving a zero-carbon transport sector by mid-century. To this end, they will be identifying and promoting robust and actionable solutions for making the transport sector not only climate-friendly, but also safe and accessible. Mobilising support for action among key actors and society at large is an associated aim of the Council's work. There is a need to develop bold solutions to transform the informal transport sector in order to achieve decarbonization goals. We must recognize that the social context is something that needs to be looked into or else the process will be hindered and the most vulnerable will be left behind. We must aim for a socially just urbanization process. Apart from managing travel demand, increased vehicle efficiency to a fast replacement of internal combustion engines or ICE vehicle with electric vehicle will be paramount to reduce the transport pollution and greenhouse gas emission and do so fast. Asian countries are well places to step up in the international race to face out ICE vehicles. The EV market also presents a new business and local job opportunities for country in Asia. Freight transport is one of the most important subsectors to decarbonize in Asia because of its increasing trend. Currently, though, it has not received the attention that it deserves despite its environmental impact. Government institutions and the private sector need to increase the dialogue and start developing decarbonization strategies. 
In early 2022, the Council will publish its flagship report on decarbonizing transport in Asia, which will showcase a range of policy recommendations. For updates, please visit the NDC TIA homepage. The Council for Decarbonizing Transport in Asia, pointing the way to a sustainable future. So as we just saw in this video, transport is responsible for 25% of energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. And the Asian region itself is responsible also for almost 25%. And trends uh, show us that this is uh, projected to grow. So we really need to do something about it. This video introduced the Council for Decarbonizing Transport in Asia. It has been set up under the NDC Transport Initiative for Asia, which is a, an ICCI project that is implemented by GIZ together with six other implementing partners. The Council and its members helped enhance the discourse on the need to not just reduce emissions, but to transform our transport systems to achieve carbon neutrality by mid-century. And that was our last input for today. We will now take a look at the poll that we asked you in the beginning of the session. Yeah, it is time to talk about money, and I want to know what to do with all my money. I can see in the screen the result of our poll. Where would you put your money on? It says immobility, 61.5%. Most of the people will go there. Power to X, 30.8% and internal combustion engines, 7.7%. It seems that it's definitely a good suggestion to go to immobility, short term, perhaps power to X, long term. We have a clue, 40, it is like 60 plus 30% between those, immobility and power to X. Great, thank you very much, Ernesto. And now we'll take a look at the agenda. Um, on the agenda for today, well, we saw that we already have, uh, we have already had a lot of program in Asia. We uh, looked in Asia and the region at the opportunities of governance. Uh, we looked at how to achieve a faster penetration of energy efficient buses in India. We looked at the role of women in decarbonizing uh, transport in Asia, women on the move. And now we are at the end of our changing transport showtime. For the rest of the day in the global program, we will have the expert clinics. We'll hear a little bit about that in a minute. Minutes, and we have the hydrogen hour. The hydrogen hour is uh, happening every day uh, in the Transport and Climate Change Week and aims to inform and train about power to X in the transport sector. Today we will talk in the hydrogen hour about sustainable power to X production for transport. And now it's our pleasure to introduce our guest, Friedel Seeleier, who is a project advisor on transport and climate change and also uh, the head behind the program of, uh, of this transport week. Please, Friedel. Ernesto, can you come a bit closer? Of course. Thank you. It is time to invite our guest, Friedel. I heard something about an expert clinic. What is this about, please, Friedel? Yeah, you know, the uh, Transport and Climate Change Week is all about the fine art of knowledge exchange. And uh, not only that, uh, it's also about developing further uh, new formats of knowledge exchange. Um, and in the expert clinic, um, we provide uh, consultations to our um, Transport and Climate Change Week delegates, mm -hmm. or not we, but a bunch of experts. Um, on this slide here, you can see the 29 experts um, who have committed to provide these free consultations um, to the Transport Week delegates. Uh, this 29 experts, for me, they are heroes because they provide a free consultation. Normally, you would probably pay a lot of a high consultant fees to, uh, uh, to make use of their brains, uh, but here today, um, those discussions um, don't have to be paid for. So um, what is also very special for me about the expert clinic is that it is a demand-driven format. Um, that means uh, it's different from a normal typical workshop where, country, where the organizer you know, provides the speaker. But in this case, the delegates, they choose who they want to talk to. They choose what is the topic um, they want to discuss. Yeah? So each expert has a different expertise. We made sure that there is a wide range of different expertises available. We have experts from different geographies, different language skills. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is someone in for, uh, for every country. OK. That was great. We thank you, Friedel. We will join the expert cleaning now that we know what it is about. And we are going to the end of this uh, showtime session. But before, we want to tell you that there is 
a 15 minutes break now, and we open a space that is called the veteran space sound wall. People that were with us in previous edition, and when I join again, talk with each other, it is a coffee lunch space. You can find a button in the left a tab a bar you have in, in the platform, just click and you can join with the other people that were before perhaps in those editions of the Transport and Climate Change Week. We hope you enjoy this space as we do and we will continue with a new shine, uh, show session this afternoon 3 p.m. and of course in the morning of tomorrow 8 a.m. Thank you very much. <laughs>